Hello everyone, welcome to the daily newspaper analysis of the Shankar AS Academy brought to you by the Civil Speedia team and the video is for the current affairs uh, dated 13th September 2024. The topics for discussion for today's video is the article on how separation of power is being questioned as PM Narendra Modi visits the resident of our CGI uh, DY Chandrachud's house as it leads to debates and criticisms judging the overlapping of executive and judiciary and this article is from the Indian Express. The next article talks about the uh, reports of the WHO where almost 22,500 people are in life-changing injuries due to the uh, Israel-Palestine war and in light of the article we will be uh, looking, at, looking at the history of the issue and this article is from the Hindu and final article is about the uh, Pradhan Mantri Jan Aroge Yojana scheme which would be launched on 23rd of September for the seniors of our country and this article is from the Live Mint. So before moving into the article discussion there is just a small announcement to boost your UPSC mains preparation with us All India UPSC mains open mock test 2024 is conducted so interested aspirants are welcome to join the test series. So now without any much further delay let's get into the articles discussion one by one. A day after uh, our Prime Minister Narendra Modi meeting the Chief Justice of India D.Y. Chandrachud's residence after the Ganapati Puja, the retired judges uh, have raised concerns over the reason of this visit. Critics suggest that it might send a wrong message regarding the separation of powers between the execute, executive and the judiciary as uh, some may say that it can affect the public interpretation of the judicial independence. Meanwhile, the party have defended that the visit is just a reflection of civility that is to promote a healthy democracy but there are still concerns raised on the issue of separation of power. So in light of this article let us see what the separation of power from the uh, prelims point of view. Separation of powers in India defi is defined as the division of government into three distinctive branches that is the legislature, executive and judiciary. Each has its independent powers and roles and responsibilities thus it helps to prevent a concentration of authority over uh, over one body alone. Its main purpose, this division of uh, power that is the separation of powers main purpose is to ensure a system of checks and balances so that no one can breach or no one can uh, control over one or the other or dominate the other with the power. Now let us see uh, what each branches play a role. First is the legislature where it has the role of making laws in the parliament through the Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha. Next is the branch of executive where the created laws are implemented under the guidance of prime minister, the cabinet member and the president. And finally third category or third branch is the judiciary where the existing law is being interpreted by the Supreme Court of India or the and the high courts of India or even the lower courts of India. So these are the general uh, general understanding of what the three branches are up to. Now let us see the legal provisions when it comes to the separation of power. First is uh, let us see the constitutional framework. First is the article 50 where under the directive principles of state policy it mandates the separation of judiciary from the executive in public services of the state. Next article is 53 and 154 where the executive power of the union and the states is vested in the president and the governor respectively which indicates the executive's independent functioning. Next next is the article 121 and 201 where, the, where it prohibits the legislature from discussing the conduct of judges of the Supreme Court and the High Courts except during the impeachment procedures. Thus, there is protection of the judicial independence. Next is the Article 121 and 212 where the courts cannot inquire into the proceedings of the parliament and the state legislature. Thus, it helps to have the uh, legislate, legislative branch to have its independence. Thus, there is protection and the regular functioning of the legislative without any interference. And finally, is the article 245 and 255 where uh, these articles outline the legislative powers of the union and the state legislatures and their respective domains. Now, moving on to the uh, judicial interpretation which supported the uh, separation of powers. First is the landmark case of Kesavananda Bharati case where in 1973, the Supreme Court held that separation of power is a basic structure and it cannot be altered by any constitution 
constitutional amendment. Next case is the Indira Gandhi vs. Uh, Raj Narain case where in 1975 the court declared that the separation of power is an integral part of the of our Indian constitution. And finally is the famous case of Minerva Mills case where in 1980 the case reaffirmed that the constitution has a balance of checks and balance system implying the separation of power between the legislative executive and the judiciary. Now let us see how the checks and balances work. Under judicial review, the judiciary can invalidate any laws if they violate the constitutional interpretation that is under article 13, 32 and 226. Next to the impeachment of the judges, the legislature has the power to impeach the judges who are proven to be dealing in misbehavior or incapacity activities under the article 124 clause 4 and 270 and finally through the parliamentary control over the executive. Checks and balances are again uh, reassured where the executive is accountable to the legislature with uh, provisions like the no confidence motions questioning are during the parliamentary sessions which again ensures checks and balances. While India does not have a strict separation of powers like countries like USA but anyway the principle is uh, integrated with the constitutional framework of our country with uh, enough flexibility uh, to allow cooperation, interpretation and having balance between the three organs of our country. Now let us move on to the MCQ. The doctrine of separation of power implies that there should be no overlap between the functions of the legislature, executive and judiciary. The legislature, executive and judiciary must work in complete isolation. Each organ of the government should operate within its own domain while maintaining checks on the others. The executive must have control over the judiciary. The right answer is the third option where as we have seen how three organs go hand in hand so that there is smooth functioning of social order in for a country for a diverse country like india the article talks about the unfortunate incident of how uh, the findings of the world health organization have brought in reports that at least 22500 people have life changing injuries and are under humanitarian crisis which is sustained during the ongoing conflict of israel and the palestine so in light of this article let us uh, go back into a brief history of the israel and the palestine conflict let us have a pre historical context during the late 1800s to early 1900s the zionist movement that is the scattered jews was beginning in europe to establish a jewish uh, homeland in the Palestine where before it was part of the Ottoman Empire. In 1917, the Balfour Declaration by the British supported the establishment of the national home for the Jewish people in the Palestine. Thus, in the 1920s to 1940s, uh, there were increased Jewish immigration to the Palestine due to a lot of uh, opportunities and at the same time due to the World War as this uh, influx of population caused tensions between the Jewish population and the Arab population. So, to note, there wasn't anything or any place called Palestine before. This idea of land is the creation in recent times. So before it was, it wasn't called as Palestinian land. It's just a land with the uh, Arab members. Uh, now after having a historical context, now let us move on to the uh, creation of Israel, which is uh, onwards 1948. In 1948, the state of Israel was declared after the end of the British rule. This led to the Arab countries that is the Egypt, Jordan, Syria, Iraq and Lebanon to invade Israel. But Israel will be winning the war and it led to the displacement of hundreds and thousands of Palestinians that is the Arab members where it is known as the Nagba or the catastrophe and this is known as the uh, Arab-Israeli war of 1948. So after this uh, displacement there was a major war in 1967 which is the uh, important six day war where in 1967 Israel again defeated Egypt, Jordan and Syria and it captures the West Bank which uh, includes the East Jerusalem from Jordan, the Gaza Strip and the Sinai Peninsula from the Egypt and Golan Heights from Syria. So not to worry, we would be seeing a map related to this uh, article in the coming slides. So there won't be any confusion later. As 
this defeat led to the uh, UN Resolution 242, which calls for the Israel withdrawal from the territories occupied in the war uh, in exchange of peace. But as any, uh, whenever there are peace uh, components or peace agreements being recognized or made, there wasn't any much further implementation of it. So, after 1967 in 1973 this time egypt and syria uh, launched a surprise attack on israel which is known as the yom kippur war to reclaim their lost territories but israel uh, eventually repels the war and uh, it defeats the egypt and syria next in 1978 camp david accord an accord made initiated by the us who who where they acted at acted as brokers to bring in peace between egypt and israel sorry and it uh, initiated for the israel's withdrawal from the sinai peninsula also but even after the accord there wasn't much uh, improvement so in 1982 this led to the first lebanon war where the israel invades the southern lebanon to fight the plo that is the palestine liberal organization and it occupied lebanon on, uh, until 2000 then in 1987 it again led to a palestinian uprising this time by the arab members in the West Bank and in the Gaza, where it is known as the first uh, Intifada, that is the Palestinian uprising against the Israeli Israeli uh, population. So during the 1970s and 1990s, even though there were peace efforts, eventually led to conflict without implementing implementing the uh, peace initiatives. Next, let us see the state of Israel and Palestine in the 1990s, where so after several peace uh, requirements and conflicts in 1993 to 1995, Oslo Accord was signed between Israel and the Palestinian Liberation Organization, which created the Palestinian Authority. So the Israeli Prime Minister Itzhak Rabin and uh, Yasser Arafat, the leader of the PLO, won the Nobel Prize for the creation of Oslo Accord, which is a peace treatment. But unfortunately, later in 1995, the same Israeli Prime Minister Itzhak Rabin was assassinated by the uh, an Israeli extremist who opposed to these peace agreements. In now looking into the recent developments in the history, in 2020, Israel had normalized relationships between with many Arab countries like the UAE, Bahrain, uh, Morocco. Uh, Sudan and so on under the Abraham Accord. But in uh, 2021, there were again tensions came on over Israeli evictions in the East Jerusalem where, where there were clashes in the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque which led to a 11-day conflict between the Israel and the Hamas. Hamas is a Palestinian uh, extremist military group. Now in recent timeline, during 2023, the same Palestinian extremist militant group that is the Hamas attacked the Israel with uh, rocket strikes and armed infiltrations killing over more than 1200 Israelis and uh, taking many hostages and uh, affecting women, children and many many others. Now again in answer to it the Israeli retaliation has been launched by the Israel where it brings on air strikes on Gaza leading to large number of Palestinian casualties, mass destruction and displacement. So this is the map of the current uh, Israel and Palestinian conflict. So prelims when it comes to prelims more than knowing the history and uh, having a background of the place it is also important for us to know the, the uh, map details of the current affairs and so on so there's there are questions related to the geographical locations of such countries now let us move on to the mcq which of the following nation does not share border with israel egypt jordan sudan and lebanon the right answer is sudan as you can see the before map sudan is nowhere here. Moving to the third news, Prime Minister Narendra Modi is likely to launch the expansion of Aishman Bharat Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana for seniors from the 23rd of September. This scheme will provide free health coverage up to uh, 5 lakhs annually for the senior citizens uh, who are aged from 70 and above regardless of their income. The senior citizens who are also part of other governmental health insurance schemes such as the central governmental uh, health insurance scheme and employee state insurance scheme uh, need to choose between their uh, existing scheme coverage as well as the new PM 
Jan Arogya Yojana Scheme Benefits. So let us see what these scheme contains. Aishman Bharat flagship scheme initiated by the Government of India was launched as recommended by the National Health Policy of 2017 to achieve the global aim or the vision of universal health coverage. The scheme aims to bring in efficient uh, measures or initiatives to holistically cover the healthcare system of India which includes promotion, prevention and ambulatory care. Ambulatory Care is nothing but uh, those are medical services which are provided for the outpatient basis that is uh, to provide medical services where the patient doesn't need to stay in the hospital such as the diagnosis, x-ray, scan and uh, minor operations are done within a day without the patient being stayed in the hospital. So through these initiatives uh, the scheme tries to cover the healthcare system at the primary, secondary and tertiary levels. The uh, Ayushman Bharat comprises of a continuum of care which includes two interrelated components which is the health and wellness centers that is the HWCs. They are nothing but they are upgraded version of the subset and the primary health uh, centers and the other component is the uh, PMJAI that is the Jan Arogya Yojana. Now let us look into the features of the scheme. Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana is one of the world's largest health insurance scheme which is fully funded by the government. Here under the scheme it provides coverage of up to 5 lakhs per family for secondary and tertiary care hospitalization across public and private empaneled hospitals. Empaneled hospitals are nothing but there are certain hospitals which are selected and approved by the government to provide uh, medical services based on certain schemes or insurance policies and so on. Under the scheme, it covers up to 3 days of uh, pre-hospitalization expenses and 15 days of post-hospitalization expenses. Benefits of the scheme are uh, portable across our country. That is, any uh, citizen can avail the medical services from any empaneled hospitals uh, which is public or private across India through cashless payment. Thus, the scheme is also cashless friendly at any point of the service or at any point of the medical procedure. Here, the uh, scheme is totally sponsored by the both central and state government where the ratio for uh, all states except the northeastern and three Himalayan states, the ratio is 60 to 40. That is 60% would be shared by the central and 40% would be shared by the state government whereas uh, and union territory is also whereas for northeastern states and uh, three other Himalayan states that is the Jammu, Jammu and Kashmir, Uttarakhand and Himachal Pradesh the, share, the ratio of share is 90 is to 10. Now looking at the uh, eligibilities the scheme covers beneficiaries over 10.74 crore families approximately and the criteria has been selected from the socio-economic caste census that is SECC database of 2011 and uh, PM Jan Arogya Yojana was initially launched on 2018. September. So, when it comes to rural areas, uh, the categories or the eligibilities are divided under uh, 5 to 7 subcategories. First is the D1, where only one room with kacha walls or kacha roof families are eligible for the uh, scheme. Next is D2, where no adult member between ages 16 to 59 are there. That is, there is no uh, abled adult members in a family they can afford the scheme. Third is the D3 which is uh, families with households with no adult male members between the ages 16 to 59 can uh, afford the scheme. Next is the D4 where families of disabled members and no able-bodied adult member can afford. Next category is the D5 where SCST households of families can afford and D7 is the landless households where families of deriving a major part of the income from manual work can afford this scheme. And under the urban uh, population, beggars, domestic workers, transport workers, electrician, mechanic, uh, repair worker, washerman, chowkidar, etc. can afford the scheme. So, these are the details about the scheme, uh, Pradhan Mantri Jan Arogya Yojana. Now, let us look at the MCQ for the previous article. Consider the following statements regarding the PMJAY. It provides insurance coverage of 5 lakh per family per year. The people can avail this benefit in both private and public hospitals. The benefit of the scheme is limited to the state where the insurance is 
held how many of the above statements are correct only one only two only all the three or none of the above the right option is option b where statement 3 is incorrect of course the scheme is not limited to the state alone whereas we can see maximum of the share is given by both central as well as the state thus it is a fully funded uh, health coverage scheme thank you so much for watching the video don't forget to give a like comment and a share and to further not to miss any other contents subscribe to our channel thank you and have a nice day